All right. Welcome, everybody, to the Life Plus God podcast. Thanks for joining us for another episode asking the big faith questions. My name is Alyssa Robinson, and I am here with one of our beloved pastors, Reverend Doug Meyer. Hey, hey everybody. Doug. Hey, hey, hey. <laughs> I'm so glad that you're here. Oh, you know what? So this Alyssa already knows this. Question. This is a big question, and it scares me somewhat. So we'll just see where it takes us, friends. Yeah. So, okay, today, our big question is, what does the humanity of Jesus mean to you? Mm-hmm. And so a lot of this is going to be very personal, um, really us exploring our thoughts, feelings, beliefs around the humanity of Jesus, what we've been taught, what we agree with, what we disagree with. Uh, but I'll be the first to say, this is just two friends having a conversation over a cup of coffee to a question that there really is no answer to. Uh, so we're not here to tell you what to believe or how to believe about Jesus and why the humanity was or was not significant. We just want to wrestle with yep. a tough faith topic that maybe, uh, Doug, how long have you been wrestling with this one? 30 oh, years, 40 mercy. years? <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's. Um, I was thinking about that, I guess, last night maybe, that um, I grew up in a... The sign out front said Methodist Church, Mm. but it really wasn't, I don't think. It was more uh, uh, a morph of a Baptist church uh, with Methodist isms. Maybe like some Baptists who got angry with the Baptist church and said, we're going Methodist, but they never really (laughs) dropped the Baptist. Yeah, (laughs) and I I say that because I, I early on was taught, here's what you're supposed to believe. Mm. Here are the Jesus rules of who he is, who he was, why he's important. And, you know, when you're a kid, um, I, I don't know what got under me, but I, I always pushed back against absolutes and would ask who said, why, how come. Mm-hmm. I think I've told the story on this podcast before about getting kicked out of Sunday school in the eighth grade uh, for being obstinate and argumentative. And um, it really was just this quandary that I continue to be, and I have gone in and out of it in seasons of all in and then not so all in. And I am in a season right now of uh, wondering and wandering and giving myself permission for my faith to, to, to kind of uh, hang out in the doubt zone. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's what I trust about your shepherding and your pastoral care is I I think that we might be cut from the same cloth, Mm -hmm. and I immediately have a distrust of pastors who speak in absolutes, because the truth is, many of these big faith questions that we have, there is no way of knowing. There is, we can, because that's, that's the, I was actually watching a really uh, interesting video clip a few weeks ago of a man talking about um, belief is doubt. Because if you believe something, you don't know it. You don't know it to be true. So since you don't know it, you have to believe it because there's no concrete evidence. And because of that, belief is doubt. There Mm -hmm. will always be doubt within Mm -hmm. belief unless it is something you know. And there are plenty of people who claim they know specific things about God, specific things about Jesus. But for me personally, I feel so far removed from the Jesus equation. Yeah. How can I possibly know? Yeah. And there are things that I've chosen to believe, and there are things that I used to believe that I have dismantled Mm -hmm. over time. I get it. But I like to think and believe that God has grace and room for that, for my skepticism. Made room for Thomas, make room for me, you know? (laughs) Move over, Thomas. (laughs) Alyssa's in town. You know, I I get all that. And even as we're talking, I, um, there are people who do think they know it all. And in part, it's, uh, I guess it's such a tremendously strong faith statement for them that it is true. There's no doubt. Mm-hmm. And to doubt is uh, less than. It's a, it's a statement of your faith that you don't believe as well and, um, or as appropriately or whatever. But yeah, I, uh, somewhere along the way, and maybe it's because 
You know, when you know a pastor um, 24-7 and know that they can— um, I have a hard time knowing all that I know about the humanity of pastors who then uh, speak in absolutes mm. uh, that cr- don't leave any room for grace or gray area or anything. And um, it just creates this kind of conundrum. Yeah, I think once back in the uh, in the days of New Day, I said to a group once, I said, if a pastor ever stands up in front of you and says, he absolutely knows ABC to be true, you should walk out. Mm. You should just walk out. Um, now that if he pre- he or she prefaces it by saying, "I have come to believe," or this has been my experience, this has been my experience. Yeah. I choose to believe, but the uh, the black and white absolute positivities, um, I don't I don't sit well with those yeah. anymore. Well, hey, let's step into some gray area right now. Oh boy, humanity of Jesus. Mm-hmm. Okay, so here's one of the things that has always stumped me, especially around. Lent, Easter, we're really diving deep into the ministry of Jesus and and this this narrative. Right. We always begin by saying Jesus is fully God and fully human. Mm-hmm. What the heck does that mean? <laughs> <laughs> I don't get it. So, mm. like, maybe if you could give some insight of like. How has this been taught to you in the past versus what you believe about it personally? Sure. Well, so there's a big theological word called incarnation. That is that very statement. God taking on flesh in the form of Jesus. Okay. And um, why it's taught, I believe, is to help uh, believers and or non-believers have an understanding of uh, the extremes that the divine creator was willing to go to to show and prove uh, his love for us and to, as many theologians, and maybe the Bible says this, to redeem the world, to, um, you know, the story goes that God created the world, uh, set us into motion, created free will, and uh, we continue to just make a mess of things. Mm-hmm. And so uh, in an act of love for his uh, or her creation, God said, I will send my son to the world to, you know, we're going to just call it straighten things out and to show my love for him and uh, or for the my creation. Um, so, you know, I, I read a quote the other day. I'm going to have to look at my notes to get it correct. It said, Jesus was the human face of God. Everything about Jesus reveals God. Mm-hmm. Now I can I can I can get close to that, where I begin to kind of just have all of my question buttons pushed is the uh, the miracles, the extra uh, ordinary events of Jesus, the man. So I guess when those are occurring, it's Jesus, uh, God, mm-hmm. and uh, the same thing ha- is will then be true. Uh, his humanity uh, is expressed all the way up. And even onto the cross, the agony of the cross, um, and then he was taken down and put in a tomb, and then was resurrected three days later. And that is supposed to be another illustration of um, the divinity of of, uh, of Jesus. Mm. And I know that doesn't help a bit. Does it? Well, because I immediate so this whole idea of first of all getting into why did Jesus have to be human? So you mentioned um, that God, we weren't getting it right, weren't getting it right. And so God in all of God's mercy sent a version of God's self to earth in the form of Jesus to help us, blah, 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 blah. Well, okay. If God is all powerful, all knowing, all this, all that, why would Jesus have been necessary? Couldn't God have just fixed it? Been mm-hmm. like, oh, I've tried everything. Well, God, if you've tried it, it it should work, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so that's a question that comes up of like, what was the purpose of this humanity of Jesus? Because I've also um, 
heard the description of like, it's God trying to empathize with us as human of like, I want to learn the struggle of humanity and be in this human because I love you so much. I want to experience what you've experienced. Mm -hmm. Well, again, if God is all knowing, God already knows what we're experiencing. God created us. Mm -hmm. We are a, and then there's this, oh, well, Jesus is the face of God. Well, we're told we're all created in God's image. So Doug, you're also the face of God and I'm the face of God. God and you know all right. of these things and so I start spiraling yeah. really quickly around like why was this humanity needed and mm-hmm. I know Karen Pastor Karen would give the answer of we just don't know the mind of God we can't claim to know the mind of God she says that to me all the time oh, yeah. and I'm just like but I want to <laughs> know something like give me something yeah yeah yeah, yeah. um and I just, well, I'm stumped of why this human piece matters, mm-hmm. except to make us feel, may, I don't know, is it to make us feel something? Like to be able to relate to Jesus in some way? Because I feel like Jesus is also pretty unrelatable <laughs> in oh, terms of like the way he forgives so quickly and the way, like his level of wisdom and maybe I'm just too young to relate at this point because I haven't established the life experiences, but I'm older than Jesus was when yeah. he died. Yeah. So yeah, I go. like, you know, so take all that and put it in a pipe and <laughs> <laughs> help Smoke me out it. here. <laughs> well, I think that some of this goes back to both the broader and then our individual understandings of God and the nature of God. Mm. Okay, so um, does God have a consciousness? You know what? 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 Are, what were the deciding factors that God said? You know, did God get his cabinet together and say, "Okay, we got to talk"? Mm. Does God have that kind of collective, or, or is God such a, a creating creative force? I don't know, but um, why? I don't understand God as God, of, God the magician, God the, you know, poof. Uh, maybe because I relate more to God through the humanity of Jesus and just the toil and the. Uh, but you're right. He he uh, he never. Well, I mean, he had some bad. He days. lost his cool one time, and then he was pretty stressed. Like right before he got he upset died. with the guys in the yeah. garden because they fell asleep. Uh, but you would like to have had like a whole book of like snarky Jesus, mm-hmm. right? That's the thing. That's I. That was one of my questions of like, what do you wish you knew about mm-hmm. the humanity of Jesus? And mm-hmm. I've said over and over again, give me those teenage years. That's what I want to know. Well, yeah, because the only thing we really have from teenage years is in the temple. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, he did kind of run away from his parents, and they found him in the temple teaching these adults. Um, but you know, it would be interesting if you were a novelist, maybe this is your next job, is to write, you know, um, Jesus, the 16-year-old. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and I think I would find it fascinating reading. A lot of people would say you're a heretic and would want it. They you know, already do, though, so I might as well lean into well, it. Well, then embrace it. <laughs> <laughs> so there are all sorts of, of way deep theologians who've gone throughout the time, throughout time who— uh, you know, probably are better equipped to sit here and have this conversation with you about uh, why did it? Why did God need to, or why did God choose to? Uh, a lot of times, the people will just say love. I mean, they will give kind of this esoteric answer mm-hmm. that probably doesn't sit well with you. Yeah. Um, well, but I think that's interesting to explore too, because like you were saying, it, it's a lot of, um, who do you imagine God to be? And I think that in our, uh, lacking of understanding as humanity and being able to envision something that's so difficult to wrap our minds around, the majority of us think of God as a being mm-hmm. of some kind, but scripture tells us God is love. Mm-hmm. Well, Love is not a being. Mm -hmm. It is uh, like an energy coursing through the world and uh, can appear in so many different ways. And is love there without humanity 
Because I think we only know love from the human perspective. Sure. But when we say God is love, does that apply to animals? Does that apply to plants? Like if humanity was suddenly, uh, climate change got the best of us and we're eradicated. Would love still exist? <laughs> Would love still be here? Yeah. Uh, well, so I think, again, it, then it goes back to your um, your understanding of love. And, and we have some limitations called the human brain of being able to consider that which you cannot, you know, package, i.e. love, mm-hmm. um, but yet we, we know love by our experiences, right? Mm-hmm. And so if we are not here to experience it, does it still exist? Mm. Well, Age I, old w- question, I right? want to choose that it does because, mm-hmm. like, I, um, I see love expressed in creation and... Um, which is then, you know, so creation isn't always pretty, though, right? Mm. Disasters, earthquakes. Where's the love in that? Mm. I see love in my pets. Uh, but, you know, I mean, if you really wanted to push me on that, am I just applying that to to their affection for me? Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> what I think that oftentimes we think, like, the beauty and love of this world is for our enjoyment when mm-hmm. like a flower will bloom beautifully with or without us. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting to think about, but you also talked about like uh, our human limitations, mm-hmm. which takes me back to the Jesus of humanity. And another reason I struggle with is God, like God, Jesus being fully God and fully human is humanity is so finite and God is infinite. And how did the two of those live within one being mm-hmm. of like, did Jesus have the same human limitations that we have in terms of lack of understanding? Or right. is or was it he that just going along? Jesus is like, I'm in this body, but I'm actually all knowing. And that's the God part. But just the yeah. just the flesh is the human part. The right. rest of it is the God part. Mm. And but I'm like, well, then that's not fully human. Yeah, yeah. You know, so um, what we know of the humanity of Jesus is expressed. Um, prime, I mean, the, our primary mode is scripture, right? Mm-hmm. And then over time, that's been interpreted by artists and cinema and that kind of thing. But I, um, I choose to believe that, yes, that it was uh, 99% humanity and that there was within, um, you know, in Jesus, um, I think all the way up into the cross, I, I think that, or maybe up to the resurrection, I think Jesus' humanity was the dominant driving force. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, wish- like when, like it, <laughs> so like when he went home at night and, and took off the Jesus outfit, did he sit down and go, oh God, it was a hard day today. That's, that's what I was just about to say. I wish that we could see more of the in-between moments Mm -hmm. of, because I've known so many pastors and so many teachers that when it comes to teaching, they know what's supposed to be done and how we're, and they try the best they can. But I've heard so many pastors say, man, I need to start practicing what I preach. Mm. Was that Jesus of like, he knew exactly what God wanted and what to teach. But at the end of the day, did he worry? Mm -hmm. Did he struggle? Did he, was he scared of like, I don't have any money. I don't have a place to live. I don't have any of this stuff because I think that we imagine him not having a care in the world because he fully trusted God, Right. but that doesn't feel human (laughs) to me. Yeah. Yeah. Now the writers over time have, have asserted uh, such a high level of confidence in his doing and his speaking and his acting. Um, Was that an effort to uh, just interpret the divinity of of, uh, Jesus through his actions to us? Um, and maybe over time, I mean, a lot of people I think are really drawn to that. Yeah. Um, questioning skeptics like you and me, you know, would love to have, you know, said, all right, now I can't wait to get to the part where Jesus wrote down how he Mm -hmm. felt at the end of the day. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and did he, uh, did he ever get to choose the next feeling, the next moment? Like when, uh, they were about to uh, feed all those people, you, did he ever have a moment of like, oh my gosh, we really didn't plan this well. Yeah. We have no food. <laughs> who, this is going to look good. Who this, was in charge who, of food? <laughs> who was supposed to call Chick-fil-A? Um, and, um, but yet we don't. 
And so some interpret the fact that we don't as further evidence that of his divinity. What I think you and I would appreciate is seeing that, you know, the, Jesus, the untold story or whatever. Yeah. Uh, Behind the music, Jesus Christ. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Uh, you know, was he always on? Was he always perfect? Was he always, did every next step? Now, you know, some would say, well, yeah, he got mad and turned over the tables. Um, but it was righteous anger. <laughs> Jesus' anger. Yeah. 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 And yeah. then there are those people who say, oh, when he was born, he didn't cry. Who said that? That I've heard so many people say that of like, since Jesus was perfect and without sin, he didn't cry when he was born. And I'm like, are you trying to say that crying is sinful? What are you, it, what are you communicating here? Like, I know a baby crying can be kind of annoying, but like, it's not <laughs> imperfection. Again, I, could that not just be uh, a human attempt to... Uh, sometimes we overcompensate for our doubt by creating the other to be uh, undoubtable. Yeah. You know what I mean by that? Mm -hmm. To be so uh, extraordinary in every way we assign equality to him or her that to, to, uh, to interpret tears as a weakness or as a, no, my God doesn't cry. Yeah. It's just assigning our own biases to to, the to divine. That, well, <laughs> uh, and, and our own bias to actions, like, i.e., oh, tears are bad. Yeah. No, they're not. Yeah. Tears are a natural reflection of, of the angst or the joy, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So. Well, okay, so you mentioned, right. you mentioned that you feel like you resonate most with the human side of Jesus. What are some of the... Uh, human elements of Jesus that we do know parts of that story that you, you really like. I like all the times when he uh, hung out with or had encounters with the marginal, mm. the folks that at least we understand as marginal through their descriptions and scripture, you know, like uh, the woman at the well, the uh, demonic guy, the, um, what what is what is the human part of that that you're like that well that really sits with me? So in that moment, um, let's just use the story of the woman caught in adultery. Jesus saw past um, the anger, the intensity, the judgment of the crowd who took her from wherever she was mm -hmm. to him, and his response was um, immediately empathy and understanding and caring and um, his ability to not be swayed. Mm -hmm. You know, I can imagine in my mind, there's probably a handful of really angry, self-righteous people who wanted to use her and him in that moment uh, to judge her and, you know, found guilty could stone her. Mm -hmm. And he turned the tide. It's you're starting to make me think I have a negative view of humanity because mm. <laughs> to me that's the divinity of Jesus, mm. not the humanity. Oh, the human side yeah. of us goes yeah, yeah, with the crowd yeah. and gets caught up in the rabble rousing and all of this. Because I, but maybe it's because I have a negative view of humans. I've seen a lot of us defaulting sure. to our worst behavior, and no, as opposed really, to defaulting to our best behavior. Observation that. The qualities that I am drawn to are uh, moments when Jesus the human expressed Jesus the divine. Mm. Interesting. If if I if uh, and, I, and I'm pretty aligned with you, I think you know most of the time. I expect the worst, especially behavior. in a crowd. Yeah. we are not at our best, and we're and anger and all those other real strong feelings don't reflect us at, at you know our best capabilities. Uh, so when Jesus um, either taught or listened or encountered or walked with or welcomed a child to his lap, um, I guess, I don't know, maybe those are qualities that I like. Wow, those are really cool. I, I would like to be that loving and caring and yeah. kind and empathetic. Um, so I don't know. I, That's I, a great question. Well, when I think of the stories of 
Jesus's humanity on display. And what I really like reading about is his interactions with his disciples, Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. because you're getting a glimpse into the inner circle. And it feels like sometimes uh, Jesus has let the veil down Mm -hmm. a little bit. So like us talking earlier about, we would love to just at the end of the day, hear him decompress and vent about like, oh, this isn't going the way I want it to. But I think we got a little glimpse of that with the disciples, especially the way he interacts with Peter. I just love it when like Peter's bugging him and he's like, get behind me, Mm -hmm. Satan. Like, yeah, yeah. I love that. And the times that Jesus is like, get off of me. I need to go be by myself. Up to the mountain. Like, I need to go out in the lake. That feels like relatable humanity right. to me. Yeah, and yeah. I'm like, those are the those are the parts of Jesus that I'm drawn to. Of like, oh, I've felt that way. Mm-hmm. And then what you were describing is the parts of Jesus that I admire and that I want to work to be. Sure. Uh, but I don't see myself in that as of yet. Uh, I would like to someday, yeah, yeah. but I see myself in Jesus being like, y'all are bugging me. I need to go to the mountains and spend some time alone. Or I ask you to uh, come over here and pray with me, and y'all fell asleep. Yeah. Way to go, guys. Get it together. Come on. All I ask for you to do. Yeah. Those elements feel super relatable to me. And honestly, Jesus turning over the tables, Mm -hmm. super relatable. There Mm -hmm. are so many times Mm -hmm. I've wanted to literally and figuratively turn over the tables uh, in my life. So those are the, the human pieces of Jesus that I'm like... Ooh, I get that. But I also wondered, like, does it depend on your personality of what you resonate with on Jesus? Because well, I think that, and it, I think it also um, see. I I um, I feel like I have need to be deprogrammed or de, mm. de, de something because there is such a strong element within me of uh, of a of a little judgmental voice that says uh, you're you're not supposed to talk like that about Jesus. And so um, if you uh, could rid yourself, you or me, of that voice, uh, I think it it would be more authentic to look at uh, like the emotional edges mm. of Jesus. What are some of the things you feel like you're not allowed to say about Jesus? Anything that cast him as less than God. Mm. In, in any way, like a, a less than or uh, I mean, I, I'm I'm pretty free to do that. I'm free to do it with you as my friend. I don't think I'm free to do that uh, from the pulpit. I think that that uh, I well, think because there's such a responsibility with shepherding people. And I understand like you don't want to say anything that will create a stumbling block in somebody's faith and send them spiraling when they're not ready to do so or send them into a space that like right that and see and and, pressure, and even that phrase pressure. a stumbling a stumbling block to somebody's face like where i'm um i guess I'm, it's arrogance too of like I'm how kinda, can you be that <laughs> well i guess like i am walking slowly into this realization that for me right now my faith and doubt and doubt and faith that it's um it's like a recipe that once you like pour the sugar and the flour and all that together, you can't go back in and pick them apart. Yeah. That it's, it is a part of my faith at the moment. Mm-hmm. And to still show up and say, you know, that what's that uh, scripture about? Help my unbelief. In the mm-hmm. midst of my belief, help my unbelief. Mm-hmm. I'm trying to find comfort in that. A lot of times it gives me angst and uncertainty and uh, my own self-judgment of less than. Like, what am I doing being a pastor if I don't have this all figured out? And um, what would it be like to be in a church where it was very comfortably known that we don't have it all figured out? Mm. You know, and that, um, hey, today we're going to talk about something. I'm going to tell you the best I know. And here's some things other people have written that they know. Uh, we need to be careful because here was their bias. Here's my bias. You know, I think um, to remove Jesus from um, a bias, is that even possible any longer? No. <laughs> I know. I feel like for the, for the vast majority of the world, whether you are a Christ follower, believer, or not, you have... Jesus is pretty well known. Like there, you, 
you will have heard something. Right, yeah. And you will have your preconceived notions based on your experience of the people who say they follow Jesus, the writings about Jesus, what how the media has portrayed Jesus, the way, I don't know, it's just... It's impossible. It's it feels impossible. It does, doesn't it? I would, I think it would be uh, interesting. And I don't know where we would have to go, what corner of the universe, but I, I'm certain there are people who would look at you and I and go, "Who who is who's this Jesus you're talking yeah, about?" Yeah. And then to, uh, it's almost like like you. I want a sterile lab where I could say, "Here is scripture. Let's you and I get to know Jesus," and um, un unadulterated by yeah. outside voices that say ought to, should, don't ever, you know, uh, no, no judgmental language to their encounter. Uh, or to Jesus. even, to even unpack the things that we've just taken as truth. And someone who's hearing it for the first time is like, that doesn't make any sense at all. Mm -hmm. What you're saying mm -hmm. and like what you're saying with absolute certainty, it I can't if get there. Really I can't get there with you. If you think about it, right. it doesn't. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It doesn't really jive. Mm -hmm. You know. And so maybe in the midst of all of that that doesn't jive, the the uh, continuation of wondering. I think uh, I'm I am claiming that wondering is an act of faith. That not having it all worked out, I'm gonna bank on the rest of my life being that that's okay with God. Oh. Because a lot of that, like I said earlier, I mean, there's just these really strong, it probably sounds like my mother's voice. I think I told this story too once where I used to say, mom, I think we know who Jesus, mommy and daddy were, but who's God's mommy and daddy? Mm. And her famous line, and I even shared this at her funeral, Douglas, there's just some things in the world we don't need to worry about. <laughs> And that I think she planted a seed in me. That, in that specific very moment. phrasing is really interesting. First, she used my big, full, and official yeah. name. Yeah. Uh, and uh, you know, I think what she was trying to to both say and not say as a parent was, you know, you're not supposed. To, what I heard was, you're not supposed to wonder about big questions like that. Yeah, because it's not the answer, the Karen answer of, there are some questions we'll never know the answer to. Mm -hmm. That would have been different, but it felt like the phrasing was, that's something we don't think about. Don't think about that anymore. Yeah, uh, and maybe it was just my insecurity as a little kid. I, I felt some uh, shame finger wagging, you know. I can imagine that, yeah. Had, had Somewhere in there was an ought and not, and good boys don't. Mm-hmm. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, I told her that story so many times. She was like, oh, are you ever going to just let me off the hook for that? <laughs> well, it's the reason I'm a pastor. So. Uh, yeah. Look what you did, <laughs> mom. Really sent me on a specific <laughs> path. That one sentence you said. It's every parent's worst nightmare of there is going to be something that I do or one say thing. to this child. It's the one thing that changes their life forever. Yeah. Yeah. That, you know, you very well, that could be true because I uh, always from little kid all the way through junior high and high school and everything, I've always been very inclined towards and curious about God and faith. And I've gone through seasons, like I said earlier, where there were just these really dramatic absolutes. Mm -hmm. of this is exactly how it is. And to wonder or question otherwise is a, a, a sin, you know, mm -hmm. and that good Christian men and women don't question or wonder. Well, let's let's keep wondering. Amen. Because sister. I got another I got another question. All right. How do you think the story would be different if Jesus wasn't fully human? I mean, it seems like a big piece of this Jesus puzzle that we've always put all of our chips on. I think probably history would have recorded him as um, perhaps like, you know, uh, the Greek gods— Maybe I think there it would have been mythological, more mythology. Mm, that's it, an interesting thought because I think the uh, God's Jesus physicality uh, created uh, a different dynamic. This touch, see, hear, taste, feel kind of histor historicity, if that's mm -hmm. such a word, you know. Uh, 
Whereas, you know, I mean, I think uh, humanity has always known that the mythological gods were always mythological. Right. But the difference is that with Jesus, all historicists believe that he existed. Exactly. There is mm-hmm. evidence that, not physical evidence, but with all of the checks and balances in place of looking at records and writings from different sources and all of these things and how widespread is it and how many you know different people right. are writing about it, whatever, there's not a historicist that questions his existence, which is not true for the mythological true. gods and goddesses mm-hmm. uh, because there isn't that same grounding. Yeah. Um, I so, kinda, so you get out of that then uh, more uh, ongoing oral history story, if you would, about encounters with Jesus. Mm-hmm. That is where you make that famous phase, phrase, a leap of faith, you know, where mm. you take what you know about Jesus, the man, and you believe Jesus, son of God. Yeah. For Jesus coming to the earth as human, we, we often talk about God's plan, you know, God's will and, mm-hmm. and all of these things. Do you think that God's plan for Jesus was this whole idea of he was born to die sort mm-hmm. of thing? Or do you think that God hoped that people would listen to Jesus and change their ways and there would be this mass movement of love and acceptance and Jesus would have lived as a full, you know, 80 years on earth or however long. Like what, because we often talk about when we're trying to process our grief and there's a big tragedy that happens, like at least within the Methodist tradition, we're not willing to say that was part of God's plan. Like, Mm -hmm. I'm not willing to say that my relative who died too young, that it was all part of God's plan, but we're willing to say that about Jesus, that Mm -hmm. that was part of God's plan. Hey, while I'm about to give you my answer, look up and see if in the Old Testament there were prophecies that uh, Jesus, uh, I think there are prophecies that Jesus would die young. Um. I should know that. See, that's where my little judgmental uh, voice comes in my head that says, Preacher, you should know the answer to that. Mm-hmm. So um, did God have a game plan when God sent his son, when God came to the earth? Is that kind of what you're asking? And Or did he every day go with the flow mm-hmm. and allow like the day to bring the learning that had because also if the people have free will and god isn't orchestrating all of this the people could have not defaulted to their worst nature and sentenced jesus to death Mm -hmm. like that could have happened at any time if god wasn't in control of the decisions that we're making right well so some (laughs) some would find comfort in saying it was all a part of a big plan the whole thing was planned. It's always been a plan. Uh, God knew every day what Jesus was going to happen, what Jesus was going to encounter, so forth and so on. It is intriguing to wonder, uh, had, um, had the powers that be, the political powers that be, not been threatened by Jesus, and had he continued to walk and teach, um, how and what that story would have uh, revealed. Now, you know, part of uh, the divinity of Jesus is revealed in his death on the cross and his resurrection. So uh, how would that, if that had not happened, how, how would we know, how would the, the, the holiness of Jesus be revealed? You know, um, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. But I did look up the Old Testament uh, mm-hmm. prophecy. So I guess like Zechariah 13, mm-hmm. uh, 13, 7 says, God will strike the shepherd and his sheep will scatter. Isaiah 53, 7 says, He was led like a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep is silent before shearers. He never said a word. Psalm 22, 16 says, My enemies surround me like a pack of dogs. An evil gang closes in on me. They have pierced my hands and feet. So I guess like Mm -hmm. they say the significance of they have pierced my hands and feet. In this article, they say that this was written before crucifixion even existed as a form of uh, execution. Execution, yeah. So 
I mean, that's interesting. It's not, and I guess you could say like he was led like a lamb to the slaughter implies young, but True. yeah. Um, I don't know enough. I don't know enough about the Old Testament prophecies to. I need Daniel to yeah, come on because he does a really good job with that connection from yeah. Old Testament to New Testament. But yeah, I don't know enough to to have an answer for that. I mean, there's definitely some interesting stuff out there around. Mm -hmm. uh, but so also a prophecy isn't the same as fortune telling. And so I don't know. The whole prophecy thing throws me for a loop too because we talk about prophetic wisdom um but we treat it as if it is someone who can see into the future which isn't really what prophecy is mm -hmm. i'm going down a weird rabbit trail here that yeah, i want to i want to get out of all right come back come back, <laughs> come back. um well i th i while you're doing that i think that this the struggle that we're talking about is um, like where does Jesus's free will come into play within mm -hmm. this humanity of I mean I guess I don't know Jesus the I've been taught Jesus chose to sacrifice himself mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <sighs> I've hit a wall <laughs> All right <laughs> I I'm like I this I always do this where I'm asking like the really really big questions and it gets to the point where I just ask in a circle, ask in a circle, ask in a circle. And it one thing leads to the, what about free will? Okay, well, yes, there was free will, but Jesus chose to do this. Okay, so that was a part of God's plan. But was it a part of God's plan? Because Jesus was the one who chose to do it. And what did God want? And did Jesus do what God wanted? <laughs> and at the end of the day, does God get what God wants? And if God doesn't get what God wants, how powerful is this God? You know, like, right. it is no, mind... <laughs> Melting. It is. That's a great <laughs> phrase for it. And, and so I think part of what is okay to admit is that, yeah, it's okay to ask the big questions. It's mm -hmm. okay to get to the point where your mind melts and then just step back and go, you know what? I think I've thunk about this enough for yeah. today. Um, and to give, I'm going to give myself this like check mark that um, this is a good and right conversation to have. And it's not. Um, it's not any indication of not believing or not this or not that. It's just, man, faith is hard yeah. and trying to figure it out and, and come to terms with it all. Uh, because in the midst of all of this, you and I, I believe, are still going to choose to do, as we say a lot, the next right thing. Yeah. You know, even in the midst of our, our uh, worn out, tired humanity, you know, yeah. we're eventually going to do be kind and nice and forgiving and loving share what we can, um, you know, encourage and pick up people. Uh, you know, none of this makes us l a less than Christian. Yeah. Well, and I do, I am convinced that no matter how assured someone is in their faith, we all have these intrusive thoughts that come in of questioning. And some people, the way they cope with it is to shoo it away. Yeah. And say, no, 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 we're not going to do that. And then there are those of us who the way we cope with it is to sit with it. Mm. Yeah. And I'm a, I'm, I sit with it and I wrestle with it and I chew on it and I chew on it and I chew on it. And at the end of the day, I come to the same place as the person who shoot it away from the beginning. And maybe there's a, but uh, that brings me I satisfaction. I actually think that's healthier than the shoer awayer. Uh, I've been a shoer awayer and sometimes shoer awayers were taught to shoe away because to, uh, that was like the devil or Satan that mm -hmm. was tempting you or trying to distract you. There's always, uh, excuses or reasons made for why those intrusive thoughts uh, come in. And um, yeah, I, I went through that whole battle and now I'm at the place where intrusive thoughts, I, I do better w with uh, inviting them in to mm -hmm. sit down and just kind of get to know them as best I can. And then, you know, I find that they uh, uh, 
I don't know, making friends with them, they kind of eventually move on down the road. Yeah. Versus, you know, I think if you keep shooing, they just keep knocking on the door. It mm-hmm. keeps coming back around until you address it. That's interesting that you've been on both sides of the equation because I've been a, a chewer <laughs> for mm. my entire life. Mm-hmm. I've never been a chewer or a shewer. I like that. That's, <laughs> I do too. that's a sermon title there. <laughs> um, okay. Back to Jesus's humanity, though, right. getting a, on the, the personal side of it, yeah. where do you see glimpses of your own humanity in the characterization of Jesus? You know, that's hard because like you said earlier, when we, not, when we looked at the humanity of Jesus, so often his humanity, man, it just seems like in a whole different ballpark than my humanity. Mm-hmm. You know, we don't really get glimpses of ego yeah. or uh, pride or judgment. Uh, Lust, bias, yeah, all the all, all the things that the we isms. deal with every single day, it, yeah. And so it's, um, you know, I, I guess what I see are those moments that we talked about earlier, like disappointment with others. And you know, mm, that's a good one. Was Jesus disappointed? The feeling of betrayal mm-hmm. we've all felt, mm-hmm. yeah. And so I, th- I think we get glimpses of that. And grief. I think it was extremely relatable to see Jesus's reaction to Lazarus, one of his good friends who died, and the, that he wept. And we got to see Jesus experience yeah, kind grief of a real for tender the loss side. of a friend. Yeah. That, yeah. Yeah. That's good. Like the, um, again, this goes to the, like the, the uh, suppositions, what all did Jesus know? Like, so Jesus having dinner with everybody, the last supper and knows that Jesus is about to betray him. Um, so does that exclude him then from having the feelings of a friend turning on him? Mm-mm. You know, did he still have those even though he knew, you know, or that Peter was going to deny him or that everybody was going to suddenly go, Jesus, Jesus who? I never hung out with him. Yeah. Um, probably that, you know, it's often talk about that look that Jesus gave to Peter after Peter denied him for the third time in a row. Imagine the emotion and that was in that look mm -hmm. of like, cause I've, I think I've always thought of it as like, uh, just because of my own nature, the, I told you so sort of Mm -hmm. look, Mm -hmm. but maybe that's not what it was at all. Maybe it was just pure like hurt. Yeah, hurt and disappointment and kind of, uh, uh, man, I, I had made up that you would be different than that. Yeah. Like, I know I predicted this, but I really wished it wouldn't happen. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we need to write our own Bible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Blasphemy. <laughs> well, like, okay, so like, you know. The, like you know Read between the, the lines with Doug and Alyssa. <laughs> so we could have on one side of the book, like, the real Bible. We'll call it that. We'll call this the left-hand side of the page the real Bible. And over here on the right-hand side, we will read it, and then we will insert yeah. emotion and text and, and our humanity. I think it can be icky humanity. us having a conversation of, if we were there, the snarky things that we would be saying behind the scenes and the questions <laughs> we would ask Jesus so that it's not actually blasphemous because we're not adding to Scripture. Oh, no, 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 We're no, just no. inserting ourselves into the story. Commentary. And then, yeah, and then Doug said, why didn't someone pack lunch? <laughs> yeah, or are you guys ever going to take a bath? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you keep showing up with the dirtiest feet. Yeah. Somebody wash these clothes. What what impact do you think the humanity of Jesus has had on your faith? Hmm. Lisa, you're asking such hard questions I today. I know, and I told you that I would. <laughs> Not that it makes it any easier. What impact has the humanity of Jesus had on my faith? I think that... Um, so here, here's what I think I have done. I, I have that other Bible in my head. So I have assigned and ascribed qualities to Jesus, um, more like a wise uh, combination of wise teacher, you know, that kind of professor that sits there in the tweed jacket with a pipe, and then at times that friend that would just come and sit by you on a bench and not say a word. Mm. And just stare out with you, with me, and go, yeah, this sucks. 
And so it's more of uh, humanity expressed in presence and being with Mm -hmm. and knowing that, um, you know, I love in Romans when Paul says, you know, nothing will ever separate you. Nothing will ever separate you. I think I love that because for a long time I thought a lot of my actions had separated me. And then to come back and just keep reading that text and reading that text, and, and uh, I've, I don't know. There are times I just have a really deep abiding sense that um, we are going to make it. I am going to make it. And, and by that, I just, you know, a very simplistic, uh, you'll see the end of the day, <laughs> you will rest, and there will be a tomorrow. In little ways and in great big ways. And um, I get that feeling at times, like I've had um, some moments in the last week, literally sitting in a hospital room, holding somebody's hand as they gasp uh, for breath and wondered about, you know, what would they die in the next day or two or three? And there is a sense, it's very hard to describe, that that is a very holy moment. Mm -hmm. And it feels... um, Tre- like I treasure those. Like it, it almost feels like I'm uh, b- have been invited in this really super close moment. In both times, it was a man. In both times, their spouse was sitting right there, and um, I don't know, just kind of living in that uh, this unknown mystery of time that was about to reveal itself, mm-hmm. and I got to be a participant in that. I say just feels holy, so I don't know if that's Jesus or who, but it's. Um, those are the reminders for me that, uh, you know, this life of, of faith has meaning. Mm. I think that, um, I think that the impact that Jesus's humanity has had on my faith is a template of how to be in relationship with God in my own human condition mm-hmm. of yeah, I'm probably not going to be as good at it as Jesus was, okay? Well, but <laughs> the things we've talked about of like ex- sitting in the emotions, mm-hmm. experiencing life with people, going off by yourself and having quiet time, the words that we say to God and really thinking about them, how to um, connect with God through our acts of service and through the way that we treat people while we're here on earth, that's, that's where the humanity impacts my faith structure because it's like the tactical plan of uh, how to connect in with the divine. Mm. And um, so without the example of Jesus set in place. And I don't know if I'm ready to say Jesus is the only example Mm -hmm. of how to be in relationship with God. Sure. Um, But that is the example that I've grown up with and what I'm most familiar with. And if without that, um, I would be flailing. Mm -hmm. I would be the the state, the mind melting state that I was in earlier would be my permanent existence. Mm. And Jesus grounds me in something, even when I I can't. Yeah, yeah, I can't uh, define what that is. Well, could it? Would this work as well? Like Jesus gives us these uh, brackets that create kind of meaning and purpose. Mm-hmm. And and what we do and how we do it with other people. Yeah, like how we, here's how to participate. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I also love that the way you said that about, uh, you know, we're s- struggling right now with the right way to say, is Jesus the only way? You know, what it would be uh, so scary ima- to imagine that um, God can be known in many other ways and that Jesus is one teacher to come to know God. Mm-hmm. Um you know, I think at times that we're... Uh, but God can do whatever God wants, and God can reveal <laughs> God's self in whatever way. In whatever like, there way. are infinite ways well, that God can reveal God's self to us, and it doesn't exclusively have to be through right. the life of Jesus. Now, am I fired for saying that? No, I won't do No, because Daniel doesn't listen to the podcast. So. Oh, good. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> well, totally I mean, <laughs> so, so to that end, there is a certain arrogance of Christians mm-hmm. that say... Our product is the only right way, mm. right? Mm-hmm. And I say that uh, in the confines of time, <laughs> you know, um, 
I think that probably, uh, you know, I'm no uh, geologist, but this planet has been around a zillion years, mm -hmm. and there's going to be another zillion years unless we choke it off. Um, so in that scope of time, I, I think God will always be present, and there will be others who will come along to introduce us yeah. to that. Yeah. Well, and you think of humanity before Jesus. Humanity existed how many, like, I think that they're now finding uh, evidence of human presence a million years ago, like something crazy. And what about the tens of thousands of years of humanity before Jesus stepped right. foot on this earth? Are we saying that God never revealed God's self through the human spirit in any way during that time? Yeah. That's bonkers to me but well that's I, yeah i mean i think that's what i meant, I meant by the arrogance of yeah. uh you know i don't know i don't think we're gonna figure that out but that's yeah. another book we can write well i just i want to invite people to to roll around in the humanity of jesus a little bit um and <laughs> and ask yourself some of the questions that we've asked on today's episode um i'm just giggling because that, that rolling around afraid. with yeah <laughs> <laughs> Don't be afraid to wonder, wander, doubt, question. It's fine. We give you a hall pass to do that. Yeah. And please give us a hall pass too. Amen. <laughs> All right. This thanks, was, Doug. Thanks, Alyssa. The Life Plus God podcast is hosted, written, and produced by me, Alyssa Robinson, and sponsored by Treach Memorial United Methodist Church in Flower Mound, Texas. If you live in the Flower Mound area, I invite you to stop by and see if Treach could be your new church family. You can learn more about all of our programs and events at tmumc.org. And I hope to catch you next week for our next episode of the Life Plus God podcast. <laughs>